Good evening. Greetings to you uh, from Southwest Oklahoma. We are here with the Sunday School lesson, which is actually, this is Saturday night, so a Saturday night Sunday School lesson. We're so happy to have you with us, and we're just wonder, it's look, we look forward to uh, having the Word of God here that we can, can study together. And if you do not have a church home, we would like to invite you to Elgin First Assembly of God, Elgin, Oklahoma. It, we are located at 921 Third Street. And our pastor is Brother Larry Toma and his wife, Sister Belinda Toma. So if you do not have a church home, we want you to know you're welcome to attend our services. And also, our services will also be online tomorrow when, our, when pastor ministers. So let's just look forward to a great time in the Lord. We do have Sunday school classes there. We have this online Sunday school for those who are, not, or who are unable to to attend and then others that just want to listen especially they're like some teachers uh, like to hear somebody else's comments and all that and we can get ideas things like that so but we want to welcome you tonight the, t the title of our lesson and this is lesson number nine for january 30 2022 the great passover event and this is our study text is exodus chapter 11 verse 1 through 12 36 our central truth is God is mighty to deliver from all bondage. God is mighty to deliver from all bondage. Our key verse is Exodus chapter 12 and verse 12. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. That was the word of the Lord that was given to Moses to proclaim. So, Lord, we just welcome you into this Sunday school class this Saturday night. Thank you and praise you for the privilege, the honor, Lord, to study your word. Thank you, Lord, for your written word that we have. Thank you. So, so good to be with you tonight. Have you experienced a miracle in your life? I'm sure that if you haven't experienced one yourself, you know of a miracle that someone had. Some things may be called a miracle that really aren't, but we know there have been those miracles. What, what we'll discuss tonight is a miracle. I know that I personally experienced a miracle, and I've talked about it again and again, and I don't want to bore people, but it was a tremendous miracle from the car accident that we had a year, a year ago, January the 8th and how I did not know, I didn't show any signs of having hematomas, and it was a terrible thing. It was, uh, didn't show up, but though I didn't feel exactly right, it didn't show up for what it really was for a, a time, for in fact, for uh, several, several weeks. But then, when it, we found out how serious it was, it was literally a miracle that I lived. Three doctors had told me it's a miracle that, that, that you lived. So we're just so thankful that uh, the Lord has done that, and you probably do know if you don't have not had a miracle, probably you have had. But you know, there's some we may not really recognize at the time, but I know you know somebody that has, and it's been a thrill to see how God has worked. And just shows us He's still He's still powerful, and He still shows Himself uh, strong on behalf of His children. So God's work in our lives, it life is never haphazard. It, it's never just a, a reckless, careless thing that happens. God's work in our in our lives, it is precise. He is a God of precision. It's always planned and it's always it always leads to a greater purpose. In the book of Exodus, he worked systematically through ten plagues to free his people from bondage. And in these plagues, and I want to go in our lesson, he will talk about it, but I'll just mention it here, was that each one of these plagues was an answer to these pagan gods that they had. And the, and so here comes all of these plagues against them. And one after another, and it was in answer to what the gods that they believed in. Why was God doing that? To show them that they were not gods at all. They did not have power. They did not. He was pointing the way to him as the one true God. That was the only hope, and that was the only deliverance for them. But you know what? They had a, a the Pharaoh. It was like a king. They, it was called the Pharaoh. And this particular Pharaoh, and in fact, from what I can, can understand from our, our lesson, is that they actually thought he was a god they really did and so here this man is responsible for all of these people and what he said they took at just face value this was it so uh, what really got me was to think of how many people because of his rebellion how many people suffered because they believed that he was a god 
and they just uh, probably, as we'd say, just went headlong in just believing what he said. So a supernatural plague was announced. What had, at, our lessons tells us that what had begun as a family mission when Jacob and his sons went to Egypt for food during a family, it turned out to be far different. So for 400 years later now, we see that uh, things have, have really changed. So they're 400 years later now. It's, I mean, that is a long, long time. Everything had changed when a ruler arose that didn't remember anything about Joseph. I don't know why, that, but, but this is what happens when history isn't taught. He didn't know anything how that Joseph, uh, who was a Jew, Joseph had saved the nation from starvation, an entire nation, tremendous. He was a tr tremendous man of God. And Jacob's descendants found themselves forced into slave labor. It was awful what they were, had gone through. Now it had come time for God to deliver them. And he had made that promise that, he, that they would be delivered. But, you know, we don't see the valleys of time in there. They never dreamed probably that it would last this long. But here it is now. It's an awful, awful thing. God had promised to bring freedom from bondage and bring them into the land that he had promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's going to come to pass. And these nine plagues that they had already experienced, and as, I, as I've already mentioned, uh, they were an, in this, these plagues served as judgments against the various idols, upon the various idols the Egyptians worshipped, demonstrating God's victory over the pagan deities. This is, again, God's love and his kindness. He's reaching out to show, let them know, because he wants them. He wants them to be saved. He doesn't delight in, in people uh, dying and have, because of their rebellion. It's, but uh, these, So he wanted them to reach out. That's all they had to do was trust and believe. And he was showing himself strong. It was to the point that the people were absolutely, uh, after one plague after another, it was awful. Can you imagine how this horrible darkness, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face? Can you imagine frogs everywhere you went? You open the oven door and there's frogs everywhere. At the table you're trying to eat, there's a frog in your plate. Frogs everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And how the, the, the flies and, and one thing after another. We could go through the whole list, but uh, my memory doesn't serve me right now to be able to tell you those. But it was awful what they went through. And to the people were finally saying, that our land is being stripped, and, we're, and the, the crops, how they were being destroyed, and was it like the grasshoppers, and, and one thing after another until they said, let them go, and Moses would go as the Lord would speak to him, and he would go there before the Pharaoh, but Pharaoh would not let them go. He would make, try to make some kind of a deal with them, and Moses would always tell him no. He said, we all go. We all go. Everybody goes. But and now that these plagues had been done, it's, it's, it was going on all nine of them. And in spite of the plagues, Pharaoh refused to let the people leave, leave from Egypt. Sin is deceptive. Our, our lesson brings sin is deceptive. It can cause a heart to harden against God. And it could lead sinners to shift the blame for their troubles that result from sin and make them determined to continue to shift it somewhere else. It's somebody else's fault or, or whatever. But, he, uh, but there comes a time, I thought about, they say in Niagara Falls, there's those people that want to maybe try to uh, navigate that in some way, and they'll come up with some kind of a contraption or whatever that they can try to navigate that. There comes a point of no return, so you decide you're going to do it. You can get so far, and then you can turn a hand, turn around, and, and, and you know you can change your mind and go back, but there comes that point of no return, and they talk about that when those people, when they get there, that point when they're actually tipped over, it's gone. You, you can't change your mind. You may realize immediately this is a crazy decision, a crazy thing I'm doing. So here it is. Here was this man, this Pharaoh. He had determined, and, he, and so he spoke for all of the people, really. He, he was like they thought he was a god, and so he speaks, and it was so harmful, this awful behavior that, had, that he was doing, and he had rebelled. And I thought about how that re rebellion and how stubbornness and rebellion is as the sin of of witchcraft. The Lord tells us that. So, but there was judgment was going to fall on Egypt in the form of a terrible tenth plague. And its horror would cause Pharaoh to drive Israel from, uh, from Egypt's borders. That's what was going to happen. But it would result in a blessing for the children of Israel. I mean, they were not going to be beaten as they left out or anything. They were going to be beaten and having like a war. They, this, this is going to come to time. And this is not the, what God wanted. 
but this is what had come to because of the rebellion and the hardness of the heart of, of this of this Pharaoh. It's a terrible thing. And the scripture talks about uh, the sin that brings judgment, ultimately the most severe judgment of death. But the salvation of God offers us an abundant life. God's people were going to escape this judgment. God made a way for his people. He always has a plan. And he always lets us know. It's not that he hides it and you have to try to figure it out and find it. He makes it very clear. God's people were going to escape this judgment. And our writer brings out that many people like to talk about the love of God. And it is wonderful. It's tremendous. It's, it's beyond words to explain the, the abundant love and grace and kindness of God. And his love that he has for us. Yet, there's so many people, they don't want to even mention talking about the judgment of God. And I knew one uh, pastor, as a lady pastor, that used to say, she said, absolutely. Uh, this was many years ago. She said, we're hearing so much, many people uh, talk about the love of God and never, never talk about the judgment of God. That we have a responsibility that we need to do that that's right. She said, absolutely. It's almost like... It's, we're, we're being fed so much sugar. She said, uh, actually, it's, uh, it, it's, it's really affecting people. Have, uh, Vicki, it's good to see you on tonight. The Lord bless you and Rio. So, but we're going to talk about in the judgment of God here. The people like to ignore this. And I've heard some, even one preacher say, people don't like to hear uh, about sin in their life. Well, we may not like to hear it, but we need to hear it. And the Lord doesn't, he's not one just to beat you on the head and tell you you're a sinner. He said, but he's the way, the truth, and the life. Well, here these people, you know, Jesus had not yet come. But here is a situation where that he's going to provide the way for them. He always has a way of escape for his children. For he was reaching out to them. He provided ample opportunities for Pharaoh, and so his people wouldn't have to face this death. But so here now Moses delivered the grim news of the tenth and final plague, and it would occur at midnight that very night and would involve the death of the firstborn of Egypt, both man and beast, and it did not matter what level of society. there was. It didn't matter uh, what your name, as we'd say, name, rank, or serial number was, even from the royal uh, from the royal household, clear down to the to the slave, it was the the royal firstborn would die, as would the uh, firstborn a child of a slave. Grief would spread all across oh. Egypt. It's horrible to think about it, and I I don't know, you know, I don't know if if this uh, if the Pharaoh. Uh, sent uh, messengers out about it and just let uh, it's no big deal. We're not going to do anything, or if he kept it from them, I don't know. But I know this: he, the scripture tells us that he did not, he did not give in at all. He was so hardened; his heart had been so hardened that he simply would not give in. And that hardness that he was going to, you know, God was sadly. This is the one thing that was going to liberate his the children. The children of Israel and the Lord, this is He used this, but He had done everything He could to get through to this. Now, here's it's going to be the tenth, the final plague. But the Egyptians trusted in their false gods to protect them. And there was a goddess uh, called Isis, for instance, supposedly protected the children. But a false god could not offer any protection against the judgment of God. It was going to happen. But Israel, in, in contrast, trusted the one true God. And his judgment would befall the rest of the nation, but would pass over the Israelites. But there was something they had to do, and we'll go on and get to that in just a little bit. But the Pharaoh had, as we said, had received repeated promises, uh, an opportunity. He had received repeated promise, opportunities to let is the Israelites go, let my people go, as Moses would, would say to them. But ha he would, Pharaoh would harden his heart and continued. He would just refuse and rebel. And our, this brings out here, and we alluded to a little bit earlier, Ezekiel chapter 18, 23 is a scripture that talked in from the New Living, Living Testament it has here. The book of Ezekiel makes it clear. Do you not think that I like to see wicked people die, says the sovereign Lord? Of course not. I want them to turn from their wicked ways and live. That's the heart of God. He wants life. He wants us to have life. He wants us to have that peace and and that passes all understanding, and he wants us to know him. That's what he wants, to really know, not just about him and have a head knowledge, but to know him and to love him and to serve him and to teach and train your children. That's exactly what he wants, It just to continue on and on. 
But God's power is going to be revealed. The result of the plague would, would the plague would be striking. All the officials of Egypt would urge the Israelites to get out of the country. But even as Moses departed, uh, Pharaoh made the truth clear. He was not going to budge. He made that clear. So that would serve for God. Uh, God had another plan. Egypt, and before it's all over with, I'll tell you what, uh, the children of Israel, they left Egypt with plenty. I mean, God blessed them and helped them in a special way. So the instructions for observing the Passover. This is another thing about God. He never hides things from you. He makes it clear. He makes, this is the way. This is how it's going to work. This is what you're going to need to do to avert all of this damage and all of this, this horrible calamity of you losing the firstborn. And it was the children and the animals. I mean, it was, it was a very severe thing. But God chose a very special way to protect and deliver his people. While he certainly could have protected them uh, without blood on the door frame, he provided a beautiful and instructive uh, foreshadowing of the blood of Jesus' sacrifice to save his people from their bondage, from, from their sins. And it, uh, I tell you, he, 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 he's, he's so wonderful. He is so, you just marvel at the ways and the, the measures that he goes to to help us and God declares what's going to happen. We observe his supernatural power and his unmatched grace in view. Every firstborn Egyptian male, human or, or animal, would die in one night. But the Israelite males would be preserved by one profoundly important yet simple act. It was just one thing. You know, the Lord doesn't make it difficult. He makes it simple. He shows us the way. He tells them exactly what to do. Here's what they were to do. They were to put the blood. They were to kill uh, the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. There they would kill and the, and the blood of the, of the sacrificial lamb or a goat. And they had to be without defect. They had to be perfect. And they would put this, they would dip this in, uh, in hyssop. In the, 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 the blood that was there, they would dip it with, and hyssop would be dipped into that. And then it would be put over, over the door, the top of the, the doorpost and down on the sides there. That's, what would have to, that's the way it would be. And when the death angel passed over, if the blood had been applied to those door frames, to the top and the sides, can you, there was a song was written, and I, I thought it would be good if I could have played it, but there was a song that was written by uh, the Spencers and how they talked about, he's, this was about the, the, about the blood of the lamb and that night and wondered how many little boys would go out and, or, and they would go out and say, Dad, make sure it's still there. Dad, did we have it? Did we do it? Did we do it right? And, and you know, they were very uh, concerned, especially if they were the firstborn. But it was a very serious thing and it was going to be an awful thing that night. If the blood was not applied, it was going to happen at midnight. They knew exactly when it was. And so they needed to get ready. And our, our lesson brings out how, what about those people that were so poor? They, they couldn't afford a lamb. Well, said you could get with another family. And you could get together and you could be in their house. You could be there. And you could, you could uh, that way you could have the, the, the safety, the provision was made for everyone. The judgment that fell on the Egyptian homes that night would not occur in the homes of those of those Jewish people. And you know, I have wondered how many people in, of the Egyptians who did believe, who did believe, they did believe in in the one true God. And I I don't I don't know how many of them did, and if they did apply the blood. I, but I believe there were surely there there were those that did respond in faith. God's foretelling of the coming Messiah through the symbolism of the Passover was to become an ongoing celebration. I like this. What we see, you know, just like the blood, they had to put it on door frames. We can actually have the, uh, the blood because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And that we can have applied, the blood can be applied to our hearts, our innermost being. And that he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And, you know, I thought of how important this was as they said to them, this was to be uh, every, year after year. They were to celebrate the Passover. They were to tell their children about it. And I thought, I've made, I, I know I mention it every week, but the importance of Sunday school. It's been a very heartbreaking thing to me that there have been so many people, uh, so many churches, unfortunately, around the United States that have actually ceased having Sunday school at all. 
And I thought, what a tragic thing. This is how we learn. You remember how that in the Old Testament, how they would tell them of whether you're awake, when you're awake, when you're sleeping, whatever you're doing, you know, walking about and, and you know, in the evenings and all during the day, you were to talk about the Lord and his greatness and his power, his might. You were to explain things to them and talk to them. And this is what I believe that many are missing in their churches that and I've, I've been saddened and just totally shocked from the first time I heard that many many children have never heard the stories that that we grew up knowing about you know Jonah and the whale and, and and all you know about David and Goliath and great truths there that they don't know about this needs to be taught and trained and so that there you have we have opportunity to do that and so I'm, I'm thankful pastor I see you're on and you know we, we believe in Sunday he believes in Sunday school I think it's one of the most important things that we have and you know even if if you are somebody that is listening or those who will be listening later if if maybe your church does not have but you yourself can be teaching and training your children reading the word of the Lord to them and these stories they need to be told again and again so I, I just think about that night, what that was like for those people, knowing. And those little, especially those the firstborn, those children waiting. And the dad would show them the blood has been applied and they knew it would be safe. Well, when the midnight hour came and those kids were safe. But what about in those Egyptian homes, how there was just weeping and mourning and just a great cry went up when they, they were not spared because they rebelled. They didn't believe. Like I said, I wonder how if the Pharaoh really, really got word out to them. They had runners and things that carried messages. I don't know all the ways that they did. I don't know, but I know this. They all knew that the one true God, and this was one thing God hated this, hated to have to do this. But this would have should have shown all of them, everybody, either whether you was Jew or whether you were not, where you were these Egyptians that the rebellion would stop, that would just, instead turn to the Lord. God desired the events of this night to continue on in their memory and of his people, so he gave instructions for that Passover. And as I uh, have understood, they, some of those Jewish homes still do that. I think it's a good thing. I just wish that they could get the connection, and we pray, and we pray for uh, the missionaries that are going there. And so we do are thankful for the Christians that are there among the Jews. They are, as we understand, they are they are persecuted. But why did he want them to keep telling every year? Why would they celebrate this? Why? Because children are going to ask, "Why are we doing this, Dad? What's this going? What's this all about? Why, why are we doing this?" And they would go back to that night and say, miraculously, I mean, we couldn't get out. And they tell of the bondage they went through. They would tell of how they were slaves and how they were beaten and how that the work just was just made harder and harder and harder and how that they were just suffering so much and how miraculously how they were set free that night because I'm telling you what, I mean, it was, there was no immunity to those who refused to repent. And so, but here's stubbornness and rebellion is that's the sin of witchcraft, I've already said. But I'll tell you what happened. That night, I mean, Pharaoh was so disturbed. He said, get out, get out, get out as fast as you can. Just get out, get out. And, and, the, and it tells us in the Bible how the, the, the women, they didn't even have time. Their bread hadn't even risen or anything. So they had to just get up and just leave and go as fast as, as they could get out. And here was the Egyptians saying, well, and well, Moses had told them to go see if you can can uh, if there's anything they'll give you before you leave. I guarantee you, they was they was ready. Just get out, just get out, just leave. We don't have time. Uh, we don't have time for you. You're literally destroying our land. Was Moses destroying the land? No, they because of their rebellion and they had listened to this ungodly leader, and yet they could see because of the miracles that every one of those pagan gods they served, the Lord was answering with these plagues brought them to show. He was the one true God. I'm so thankful for the ones that possibly did surrender. But now here, this is as they're leaving out. Now, I'm telling you, they literally, they, they plundered. Uh, they plundered those. They stripped the Egyptians of their wealth. But they didn't steal it from them. They were just saying, here, take it, whatever. You, well, I was wondering if you had any extra clothes. Yes, here, here, take them, get out. Uh, well, I was wondering, is, and whatever they wanted, it was just go, just get out of here. And they thought if they could just get rid of them, that everything would go back 
to normal. I'm telling you, without the Lord and loving Him and serving Him, it won't go back to normal. It's not normal. I'll tell you what's normal is to know the Lord and to love Him and to serve Him with all of your heart. You think of that group of people that went out. I, I don't know how many that there were for sure, and it had been four centuries now. And I mean, can you, I couldn't, I was trying to under, get, just think about that. And for 400 years, they had never known anything but bondage. And it said in the verses that follow, we find the Israelites numbered 600,000 men. And that didn't include the women and children. And you think about that. Some commentators estimate the total number could have been more than 2 million people. Think about that. Them leaving out. I mean, in a hurry. Just get out of here. We don't even want you here anymore. Now, I don't know how much, uh, what that was going to be like getting work done because they'd been depending on these people to do it and forcing them to do it. But anyway, God's promises to bless the whole world through Abraham took a real form that night when some of the Egyptian people did leave out. They left with them. They wanted to go. You know what? You wonder if they weren't thinking, I want the blessing. I want, they might, maybe they just wanted the blessing. I don't know. There are people like that. They don't want to work. They don't want to get in and work in a church and really be a part and all, but they just want the blessings. Well, maybe they were like that. And there were some, I really believe, were sincere and said, there is, this is the one true God. I want to love him. I want to serve him. And they went with him. So what is God saying to us? Well, after three, 430 years, Israel was free from Egyptian slavery. What was that like? They didn't know what freedom was. They had no idea. God wanted them to remember this miraculous event. So he commanded them to keep that Passover, celebrate every year they were to do that throughout the generations. Then you would think about this, and the Lord wants us to remember. He wants us to remember what he did for us. And he died on the cross, and he didn't stay dead. They put him in a tomb, but death couldn't hold him. How the, he raised him up and thanked the Lord. We need to remember that time. Uh, think about that time when you gave your heart and life to the Lord. I remembered a nine-year-old girl. I gave my life to the Lord the first time he ever dealt with my heart. First time I ever even recognized what about conviction. And so be thankful for that and tell people about it. I believe we need to spread that word. Jesus changed my life. Every decision I've made since, since that day was based on that decision. What a great time. It's a great thing. This is what the Lord wants us to think about that, talk about that, tell that. You know, the Apostle Paul, he gave his personal testimony again and again. Some people say, you shouldn't talk about yourself, talk about something else. Well, I know about this. Paul knew about that. He said, I know what it is to live like an habit made and look like I was the big it and all. He said, but when I found out, and he found out in a very remarkable way when the Lord struck him down with that light, got his attention, and he that's what it took. That's what it took. That is what it took for him. It had to be just a real, a really like a real jolt. But he gave his life to the Lord and was so faithful and so true. Similarly, we celebrate communion. Communion is something that and I, I believe Pastor said we would be doing a communion tomorrow. And I remember, and I've mentioned it uh, to them, to him and his wife, there was a woman that I remember when I was a little girl that every time we would take communion, I, I really really came became aware of how serious communion was and how special it was when i watched this lady every single time we took communion i don't rem ever remember a time that this woman didn't just begin to worship in such a way she always worshiped but it was so different when we took communion and she thought about what the lord had done he didn't have to do it but it was because he loved us and he was so willing to do it but as she would just worship the Lord in such a way, and she would weep and just like so grateful and so thankful. And so as a little girl, I grew up watching that. And I, I'm thankful for that example. Because as we, what we always did in, in, that, in that church, we would always stand around. They had us all come up to the front. We would come up around the altar and, that every, and we'd take the communion. There I, I can see her now. She'd be standing over here. I'd be back here, and I made sure I couldn't help but watch. And it made such an impression on me of how important and how special that this is. It's not just drinking a little bit of grape juice and, and eating a little cracker. 
That's not what it is. It's so more it's what he did for us. And because of what he did, we are free from the bondage of sin. Because of it, I can face tomorrow because he lives and we have his life in us. Oh, thank the Lord. So it says the next time you celebrate communion, think about the miracle of salvation which God has brought into your life. And we want to be challenged, it said, to watch in coming days for examples of God's divine power at work to save, preserve, or bless people. Let's be attentive. Let's don't just go through, we're in a big hurry, but let us really try to see. And think of the times, how that God helps us. And, you know, we avert maybe uh, injuries and avert uh, maybe accidents and all kinds of things. Yes, we were involved in one, but God knew about it. He took care of us. You know, God turns a test into a testimony. Thank the Lord. So if, if there's anyone that's listening and you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior, you can find this great gift of salvation even now and ask the Lord to come into your life and cleanse you from your sins. It doesn't matter what they were. He, he forgives. He never holds it against you and beats you over the head. It's Satan that does that. You come, Jesus, come into my life. I want to serve you. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I need your forgiveness. I'm helpless and hopeless without you, and we are. He will forgive you. Jesus, I want to live for you. Tell him that. Believe me, he's got a work for you to do. So may we pray and believe and put our faith, trust, and confidence in the Lord and talk about Jesus. And be sure those of you who have children, grandchildren, teach these truths to them. And I know that many of you do. So may the Lord bless you and keep you. I look forward to uh, attending Sunday school class uh, tomorrow. And I'm going to be a student in that class. And I'm going to be glad that I can sit there and think, just revel in what the Lord has done and his greatness and his faithfulness to the Jewish people. You know when people say they're going to push him into the sea, some nations will say that. It won't happen. They may wind up in the sea, but it won't be to the Jewish people. So may the Lord bless you and keep you till then. It's been great to be with you tonight. Lord bless you.